So from your perspective, I, I imagine it's something kind of subjective and different people would probably define it differently, but how do you define the word politics? Like, great, great question. Great question. I think that the question of ethics, ethics is about how do I lead a good life? And politics is about how do we lead a good life? You know. Now, normally with politics, you're talking about at least a couple hundred people, not just a few dozen, but sure, even at a small scale, that's really what politics is about. How do we together live a good life? And it may be a society of dozens, it may be a society of thousands, or it may be a society of millions. Yeah. Okay, it's interesting. So politics to you is connected to like ideals of what is a good life and how do we institute that amongst large groups of people, I guess? Or, or the lack of ideals. <laughs> you know, I identify as a, as a nihilist. I'm a very pragmatic and non-idealistic person, but those questions are still really, really pressing. So yeah, and indeed, you know, again, I'm not being sarcastic when I say, oh, let's give you an example to stick with Batman. You know, when I taught university classes in China, I asked the students, seriously, uh, you look at Batman, you look at Spider-Man, do you think this is a story that parents should teach children? Do you think this is a story we should use in classrooms as teachers? And, you know, not in a trivial way. Like, let's, let's really think about what this teaches children. So, yeah, those are questions about uh, how we together can live a good life or form a, a good society. Um, and you don't, you don't have to believe in anything. You don't have to be idealistic to really wonder about that and look around it at trying to come up with new answers. Do you think that many people consider, because I'll just think, going back to your definition of politics, it's like, yeah. it, it seems reasonable to me. I mean, I, I'm still kind of grappling with what exactly I would define that as or what it means. But I, I don't think, I mean, do you think the average person sees politics like that? Or, or do you have an idea of what the typical perception is of that concept of politics? Yeah, you know, so we're talking mostly about white Western English speaking people here. It'd be a different answer for Japan or India or, or Cambodia. But I think if you're talking about white Western English speaking people, they mostly inherit a political identity the same way they inherit a, a religious identity. You know, um, why are you conservative? Why are you a member of the Republican Party or something like that? Very often the, the real answer is that that's because their parents taught them to be that way or their grandparents taught them to be that way. And they put very little thought into what politics is or what their role in it ought to be. Uh, now, a really great question would be, what percentage of the population is an exception to that rule, <laughs> you know? And I, I'll just mention also, so I, like, you know, you could call what I do political entertainment, you know, <laughs> that, that, you know like uh, um, that might be insulting, but I don't mind being insulted. But you know, if I'm making entertainment, it's for those people also. Look, I don't look down my nose at them. I think there were a lot of people who've never really questioned who they are politically or what they're doing or what politics means to them. They've just been carrying on doing what their parents and grandparents expected them to do. And still, you know, there could be something really meaningful they encounter on my channel and they, you know, I get email from some of those people and that, that could be something really meaningful for both of us, you know. But yeah, you could divide society into two classes of people, those who've really come up with their own answers to those questions and those who've never thought about it. They're just carrying on the same pattern handed down by their parents and grandparents. All right. I, I kind of get the impression a lot of people think of politics as just kind of like powerful people arguing or something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Right, right, right. Well, no, but look, I mean, what if, what if you live in communist China? You know, what, uh, one of the reasons why most Chinese people are incredibly ignorant of politics is that they're so far removed from it, that, that they really, that in communist China today, I'm talking about 2020, not the past, that definition would make a lot of sense. And the most, the greatest role you can play as a member of the public is to kind of follow those debates from around the edges. And, you know, people like military generals might be quite important in Chinese politics and find out what these people in the military are saying and what other significant figures in the dictatorship are saying. Um, you know, I would say, too, a country like Egypt, how much of a role really can you have in, in politics? Uh, Egypt was always teetering on the edge of, uh, between democracy and dictatorship. There are countries where that definition would make a lot of sense and would have a lot of gravity, I think. All right, then. Let's take a little step back here. Let's talk about um, your channel in general. So you've got a YouTube channel that you've been doing for what? Yeah, five, over five, five years. years. Yeah, over five years, and we're coming up on five million views now. I think it's 4.7 million views. 
All right. And from my understanding, you specialize more in vegan specific yeah. stuff, and then you've kind of more expanded. And I, I see you doing a lot less vegan content these days. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Uh, the very beginning of my channel, I assumed it was going to be an atheist channel. So I, I am an atheist, in case people hadn't guessed. And the name of the channel even refers to that, Abalaciel. It's sort of a sense of like tearing God down out of his heaven. And at the, what that means? It means tearing God down? This is an over-translation. This is uh, expanding a little bit. But yeah, so in French, Abalaciel is like, let's tear down the government. Let's tear down the state. Abalaciel, that's quite often used in political protests. And Abalaciel is used less often. It would normally mean let's tear down the church. Let's tear down religion. But it literally means let's tear down heaven. Let's tear heaven out of the sky. So a very kind of ambitious, um, atheist political meaning. So yeah, the, the channel started off with that. And I had, um, I had just formally quit Buddhism. I'd been a scholar of Buddhism for, I like to say, 10 years. So I was interested in the critique of Buddhism and the critique of religion. And there was a lot of that popping on YouTube at that time. And I was really aware of the success of people like The Amazing Atheist. People all the time insult me saying I'm not good looking enough to be a YouTuber. And I say, well, you know, I, I was partly inspired by The Amazing Atheist. I don't think you need to be that good looking to be successful on YouTube. But yeah, there was then a long period where, I mean, when you and I first spoke, um, I was really trying to just make friends in veganism. And where that, I know it sounds very simple, but making friends in the vegan movement was the main thing I was doing with my channel for a couple of years. And that's now well and truly over. So you see, veganism comes up once in a while. But um, put it this way, these days I wear veganism like a shirt, but I don't wear it like a tattoo. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So can you, I, I imagine it's a, I know a little bit about your, uh, in your, the goings on with you in the vegan community, a vague idea. But just to, without going, so without, it's probably very complicated, but without going too in depth, can you give us like a break, a general summary of how you kind of decided to step away from that or what happened with you, between you and the vegan community? I know there's a lot of controversy, but. Yeah, well, the, the controversy is fun to talk about. I, I don't mind. We can talk about that. But the, the, I mean, in terms of if you want to start at the end, in terms of stepping away, I really just felt there was a total lack of talent. I mean, as you said earlier, there's some talented people, some not so talented people. Um, going through all that controversy, I felt the positive part of it was that I met and spoke to kind of everyone in the vegan activist scene, definitely everyone who speaks English. And all those people know me, even the people who pretend they don't know me, they know me, they know my work. And that was a good thing about controversy was it, it did connect me to all those people. Years and years went by. Something I used to say to people a lot five years ago was where do you want to be five years from now? What are your goals? What are you planning to do in the next five years? And then what are we going to do like together to get there? And five years went past and all those people have accomplished nothing and they're not trying to accomplish anything. Um, so no, for, in terms of my stepping away from it, I, I have formally said that I quit the vegan movement. I still, I still eat a vegan diet, but I have said that I quit vegan activism, which was a big turning point for me personally. Uh, you know, I, I did literally shed some tears giving up on that. Um, you know, that was really deciding, okay, that chapter in my life is now over. Um, but you know, the, the actual controversies, some of them were very shallow and very silly. Some of them were very serious. I've always wanted to be honest about the things that other vegans were being dishonest and evasive about. It's like a real simple example that I think people in the audience can relate to. I think most people who are not vegan right now, a lot of vegans pretend that they don't kill rats that they never would kill a rat, that they never would kill a cockroach. And I, that was something right off the bat, my YouTube channel was like, no, I'm gonna be honest about this. I'm vegan, I kill rats. Even if I have the delusion that I don't kill rats, my landlord kills rats. When I go to the hospital, there are no rats at the hospital because the hospital is employing you know, a pest control company and they kill the rats at the hospital. I buy groceries and the groceries are produced at a farm that kills rats, no. Our society is built on killing rats. We're going to keep on killing rats. Let's really be honest about this. And let, you know, we can philosophize about it. We can talk about it. Um, if you want to, we can shed a tear about it or something. Yeah, are there rats? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they came. And they came after me, right? So <laughs> those people all hate me. No, and there are people, and they keep rats in their apartment as pets, and they let you know that rats are just as intelligent as a three-year-old human child and they love rats and if only i kept a pet rat i would understand and 
Oh yeah, and there were people who like uh, break into laboratories and steal the rats that scientists are doing experiments on and liberate and then keep the, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were rat people, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 they're hardcore, man. I, one woman wrote to me, she's a middle-aged woman now, and um, you know, she wrote to me and I, I Googled her and I was scrolling through her past social media friends. I said, hey, look, I appreciate that you're now a fan of my channel, but I can see just a couple years ago, you were, you were one of those rat activists. <laughs> and she joked around, but, but you know, it's tragic. It's tra like, I, I appreciate that. I'm not gonna say rats don't have feelings, but we kill rats. And uh, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we're still gonna be killing rats. So let's, let's not lie to ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I can. I mean, I don't. I try not to kill like spiders and stuff. I don't think it's it's crazy right. to to not want to kill a rat. But I. But it's interesting that right. of all the things you could spend time doing activism for, the right. two rats. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So okay. So I, I, wait, we were still talking about the. So what happened with the vegan community? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, I went through a series of of controversies. But as I said, I I saw that as more positive than negative. The one that, you know, had the biggest impact financially was the controversy with Durian Rider that ended up in court. So if people don't know, at that time, uh, Durian Rider's girlfriend, Freely, was getting about 12 million views a month on YouTube. So she was, that was a big YouTube channel. And I don't know if maybe Durian Rider was doing 2 million or 4 million a month. Like he was big, but he was very much in her shadow. And the controversy was attached to both of those. So I had a major vegan YouTuber who made up the allegation that I was a pedophile out of thin air. He specifically made up the allegation that uh, he had spoken to underage girls directly who had provided him with evidence of this, that he was going to take the police. He was going to have a gang of people beat me up and drag me to the police. And if you want to know what's the basis for this conflict, he was a vegan YouTuber who made exaggerated health claims about the benefits of the vegan diet. And uh, this included, but was not limited to, his claim to have cured Crohn's disease. So that was one that I was really harsh with him. Like, you know, okay, if you want to make vague statements that the vegan diet help you lose weight or something, I'm not going to go after you. But no, Crohn's disease is a really serious disease. And I was really saying, no, this is something dangerous and bad and evil and wrong to mislead people suffering with this disease that we can cure it through eating more bananas. That's not true. And everybody knows somebody who's got Crohn's disease, by the way. I mean, it's... Yeah, I it, know people. Yeah. So anyway, well, just so you know, you can't cure it with bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so so you. So yeah, so that's so that that's one example. Though. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, did he was it like a direct retaliation to that, or, or had you built up sort of you criticized him multiple times, and then he started like looking for dirt or looking that. For that was really the turning point. No, I mean I, I would say that really directly did yeah uh, create the the conflict, and you know he's also someone who was trying to make his living out of giving that kind of diet and health advice. So it's not. You know, I mean, I can kind of understand it from his perspective. Unfortunately, it's an insane and evil perspective, but I can understand his perspective. I just want to give him credit where it's due. Today, 2020, five years later, he has apologized to me. He offered to delete all the videos and all the blog posts that were denouncing me and calling me a pedophile. He has, yeah. So that's five years later, he did the right thing. Um, sorry, maybe it was four and a half years later when that started, but many years later, he did hit a turning point. So that stuff is gone from his channel. Unfortunately, the damage is done uh, for my career and my life in many ways. The flip side of that is, as I said before, the, these controversies, they put me in touch with really all of the leading vegan activists and vegan YouTubers. Um, so I, I got to find out what I was missing in terms of the movement. So yeah, there was a, very briefly, there was a fundraiser. People donated, I think, 6,500 US dollars so that I could have a lawyer and take him to court. We went to court, to a defamation uh, lawsuit, or whatever you wanna say, criminal charges for defamation. So yeah. But when you, you, you were, uh, he was, the defamation charges were against him? for what Yes, you, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, because he, he defamed me claiming that I was a pedophile, among other things. <laughs> he, made, he made up a lot of other lies. And no, I mean, you used a good term before you said, so did he get angry and go digging for dirt? Like, I wish, I wish he'd done any digging. It was, it's all just fantasy. And the stuff he was saying about me, a lot of it, like it doesn't make sense geographically, you know. And the last time I talked about, I talked to him about it, it was just a couple days ago. I think like three days ago, I talked to him about this. 
and he seemed to genuinely have no memory of what he'd said. I could provide him with screenshots and so on, but um, my impression of Doreen Ryder is that he is a genuinely mentally disabled man. He has said in court under oath that he has brain damage, and he's talked about that on YouTube from a bicycle accident. He had some kind of serious uh, brain damage from a you know concussion to his head, and you know he may have had other mental problems before that. And again, I can just say he's talked a lot about his own mental health history and learning disability history and so on. But that, as crazy as it sounds, he seemed to be sincere in not really remembering what he said. And most of the stuff he made up against me was, in a word, crazy. But I got to see how crazy all the vegans were because they all jumped on. They all wanted to believe it. And, you know, that's obviously that's a very disappointing cross-section of the movement when you see all those people lining up to denounce you and make up stories about you. Um, you know, I mean, anyone, if, if you were, you know, if you were part of Buddhism, which I used to be, and you had that experience, you'd then look at your fellow Buddhists a little bit differently. Well, you know, I had to learn to look at my fellow vegans a little bit differently, too. <laughs> so, so was it a series of controversies and how this was all handled that kind of soured your, like, is that kind of what happened? Was you, you... I'm going to be, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. The answer is no. That's a totally reasonable perspective. But, you know, I am a very, very positive, highly motivated person who's happy to do my own thing, even if I think kind of everyone else is an idiot or everyone else is against me. So I know, like, it might be hard for other people if they don't know me personally to appreciate that. But no, there was one controversy after another, whether it was Durian Ryder, Unnatural Vegan, Nina and Randa, Vegan Cheetah, Charles Marlowe. There was this long series. What Nina and Randa's dad, I'm forgetting his name now. Jeff, Jeff Nelson, all this crap. Yeah, there was this crazy series of controversies. One more ridiculous than the next. But through all of it, I was happy, I was upbeat, I was smiling, I was laughing about it. Like, people insult me on the internet, and I, I it, it, like, it only, boy, it's wind, it's wind in my sails. Like, honestly, I feel totally positive about it. What broke me was the lack of talent. So, two real quick examples. I wrote a children's storybook. Storybook's been translated into six languages. Tons of people love this storybook. Wanted to get an illustrator for the storybook. Could never find a vegan illustrator who wasn't completely insane and useless. <laughs> we, we dealt with some people who were insane and let me down. And, um, you know, I tried to have a conference where you'd get together a bunch of people and they'd present papers at a conference and then we'd gather the papers and publish them as a book and bro, the lack of talent. At that time, I had money in the bank to do that in Vancouver. I was going to do it. And, um, you know, the lack of talent uh, made my teeth whiter. So there were things like that that to me, and it was just like, well, look, guys, I've been doing this for five years, and I don't have one other person I can work with or collab on, like not even collab on a YouTube video, you know. So I thought it's time to, it's time to end the experiment, you know. When you, if, you, if you say to yourself that something's an experiment, you have to accept that the outcome is unknown. Like, if you say, okay, I'm going to do this as an experiment. Like, I'm going to try flying my flag for vegan activism and say, hey, let's get organized. Let's do this. Let's go, go, go. Who's with me? You say, okay, I'm going to do that for five years. But then you have to admit, okay, well, this was the outcome. After five years, you know, um, I'm all alone. And there's, like, nobody I even respect or want to work with or something. So, yeah, that was what that was. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I kind of experienced a similar thing on UNAP, quite frankly. In that. Oh, yeah. Because I imagine it would have stayed there longer if there was more peers or a sense of like, there, I mean, there was a couple. I don't yeah. want to discount. There was a few people, of course, that I clicked with. But I mean, if there was like a strong, tightly knit community of talented people, I'm sure that would have kept me there way longer if there wasn't. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, something I used to say to people now like five years ago was, look, if you think my videos suck, you know, uh, leave me in your shadow eclipse me like do better like you know get on the mic and you know show me how it's done because I would be so happy to have somebody to look up to you know like having people that are better than you people you admire um, you know that's that's really that's really great too so yeah yeah no no I, I feel you you know whatever your art form is and the, the only thing I'd add is you know for me it became an art form when I started doing YouTube, I didn't really see it that way. I used to say, I know you can probably remember me saying this from a million years ago. I used to say, no, for me, this is just like sitting down in a coffee shop and talking to a friend. Uh, and, you know, it, it did become an art form. It became a major creative thing in my life. And yeah. that's, that's still what it is, which is, which is still positive. Change. I've noticed an evolution in the last couple of years. In particular, like you, you do a fair, I mean, I remember when I first saw your channel, it was pretty yep. much just 
like, uh, you know, one long interrupted yep. page or whatever you had in your mind. But now you're editing and you're including, uh, you're citing, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, sources and quotes and there's a, there's a lot going on and there's a... Uh, yeah. Interesting. So can you talk, let's talk about that just for a minute. I, I think a lot of people in here maybe, I mean, I know Vegan Health Quest has a few people in here who are familiar with your channel to a degree. But um, what's your process? Like, I, we've, we've already kind of just given the basic summary. You're making these kind of political commentary videos, but like... How does like a video start and end? Like I imagine you see or, or read something and then that kind of gets an idea going and then how do you get from there to... Uh, Dude, I think nobody but my girlfriend would really believe how spontaneous it is. That it's like, it's so spontaneous, it's crazy. And that's like, that's the sense in which I'm good at it. Once I sat down in a Starbucks, I was in a Starbucks and my girlfriend was here at home at the apartment. And I was like, Jenna Marbles. Fucking bitch. She's feeding her dogs dead cow meat as dog food. And fuck that. She says she's vegan, but she's buying dead animals all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, and it was... It, and while I was sitting there in the Starbucks, I made the whole video. And the couple of sources I didn't have, I didn't need, I was emailing my girlfriend, like, hey, can you find this? Can you find that? I asked my girlfriend, can you find the particular brand of dog food? Jenna Mar and she did. She found it. So I don't know. I don't know if that was half an hour. Or we could have been a whole hour sitting in that. Stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I did a lot of work to go into that video. And I got this music, and I got the visuals, and I put it together. And you know, and yeah, and, and I got a, like five hundred or a thousand thumbs down from Jenna Marbles fans. I don't know. We should check how many thumbs down that that has now. But you know, no. And it was it was totally totally spontaneous and unplanned. So that's that's something within veganism. But all kinds of other stuff I do. Um, it is extremely spontaneous, even talking about like politics of Cambodia, politics of ancient Greece and politics of ancient Rome. And if there's one thing I've really learned is that if I, if I don't do it in that spontaneous way, even if the factual content is the same, it will not be the same for me in terms of its mood or spirit if I go back and watch it again. Even if there's something, something comes up like a friend of mine is dying of cancer. So it's like I have an idea for a video and then I can't make it for five days. You know, there's some delay like that. When you come back five days later, it's, it, I'm never going to make that video I made. I would, I'm never going to be able to make the video I would have made if I'd done that five days before in terms of what's going on in my mind. All the time. I step out of the shower. It's something I thought of when I was in the shower. And that's the video. And i got to make it now. Because if I don't, I won't capture that spirit. You know? And I, I, haven't, I haven't been real angry lately. My, my YouTube channel is, is consistently more popular when I'm angry. Uh, people like the video. That also relates to the Amazing Atheist thing. I would give that. I would give that as advice for someone starting a YouTube channel. Even if you can come on the mic hot, if you can come on the mic angry. Um, that does reach a bigger audience for whatever reason. But you know that anger is maybe an easier emotion to to understand. You know, if you're angry about something, then you know make the video while you're angry. Don't do it later. Don't pretend to be angry. You know, but when you're feeling that way, when you're feeling, yeah, 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 put it together. So yeah, even even the most dry intellectual videos. Um, yeah, I did a couple in the history of science. The, the videos I made talking about Sir Isaac Newton, they were completely spontaneous like that too. So yeah, um, and I, I think nobody would believe how spontaneous and unplanned all that stuff is. Okay, interesting. So you, you just you have the idea, you record it, and then anything else that's seen in the video, you're doing that after. That's like post-production for you. You're not like planning things out elaborately in advance or anything. Well, okay, even if there is planning, it all happens at the same time. Like it's all thrown together. Yeah, like yeah. I I, I think that shows. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I think that's what, one of the things I like about your channel. Okay, so let's talk a little bit because so this the the Jenna Marbles video clearly was controversial. Your presentation was. I want to talk a little bit about your sort of bluntness because you're very uh, you know you're I t consider you a very thoughtful person. You, you do. You, think about a lot of issues, you do a lot of reading and research and what have you, but in terms of uh, concern for, let's say, offending your audience, you seem to have none. Yeah. And I wonder what your sort of perspective is on that in this day and age with the uh, seemingly uh, right. major emphasis on uh, political correctness and all this kind of stuff. You seem to be willing to kind of say things that you're, you, you also seem very aware that these things you say are potentially going to offend people yeah. or that they're controversial, and I, I don't get the impression that you care. Um, I don't have like a, I guess a specific question, but I wonder if you could kind of talk about that a bit or where you're coming. Well, I I I'd only disagree with your wording, because um, no, I mean it's it's an interesting point. Like I, I understand, I, I agree with the fundamental point you're making, 
but I do care. I'm actually a very caring person. And that's also why those videos are made in the way that they are. So whatever the issue is, like racism against First Nations people or the Black Lives Matter movement, like even if these videos are offensive, and they are to some people, uh, even my videos talking about learning Chinese and the history and politics of China, believe me, those videos would be offensive to some people. You, you know, you're not a member of the Chinese Communist Party, but about a billion people are. They'd find what I have to say about Chinese people. As offensive or blunt or, you know, inconsiderate about my audience's feelings as those things may be. I just made videos talking about Judaism and anti-Semitism. I'm ethnically Jewish myself. I'm completely aware my channel can be deleted for those videos. Like those are offensive enough in really talking about what's wrong with Judaism. I know, I know this is gonna hurt people's feelings, you know? And I've had, I had a couple of uh, Orthodox Jews who were fans of my channel. And I know, cause they used to write to me trying to convert me. They were like, hey, come on, join Orthodox Judaism. Cause they know I'm genetically, genetically Jewish, whatever that means. Um, I do care. A lot of it comes from a place of caring and it goes to a place of caring. And that's one of the reasons I reach out to and talk to my audience is that I really care. I care about them and I care about the issues. However, everything else you're saying is completely true, that it is very offensive, it hurts people, and for better and worse, it, it changes people's lives. If you're asking why, I think that was the question is why, why is that my format or why is that my aesthetic? I would say it really has to do with the total sense of, of rage or outrage I have toward Canadian society. And I'm really kind of screaming out my sorrow and bereavement at, in the face of the indifference of Canadian society, just as I would say Voltaire, the author of Voltaire, was screaming out this way um, when he wrote Candide about what he saw as just the unbelievable, um, you know, unbelievable evil that was thought to be good or normal in the society that he, that he lived in. Now, why do I say that? I used to live in Germany. I used to live in Cambodia. I used to live in Thailand. I've lived in many different countries around the world. Probably, probably if I'd stayed in any of those countries, probably if I'd stayed in South Korea or Japan, I probably wouldn't be like this. I probably wouldn't be living this way. I wouldn't have this sense of, of uh, you know, real, real bereavement. Um, and that it really is, you know, my status as a dissident in Canada. And let me just mention, you know, cops fuck with me here. I deal with cops face to face and you can probably just guess from the tone of my voice. I'm very good at dealing with cops who try to intimidate me or try to bully me. I'm, I'm someone who has a background that lets me do very well in Canadian society on that surface level. So people might not suspect how extremely unhappy I am here and extremely unhappy I am with the status quo. But my point is, again, it's not that I have some kind of standards that are so high. It's, it's totally possible that if I just stayed in some other culture that I fit into a little bit better, where I appreciate the politics and the society a little bit more, I feel more positively about the society that I'm a part of, that it wouldn't have that quality. But yeah, um, I'm part, so to stick with Jenna Marbles, I'm partly pissed off at Jenna Marbles, right? But I'm pissed off at the whole fucking society. It's the society of walking your dog and feeding them cow meat and chopping up pigs to feed them to your dog and, and treating a dog like a toy, taking a wolf and breeding it to the point where it more resembles a, a cat, you know? Um, you know, there's so much about this that's wrong. And then the Jenna Marbles is celebrated as a vegan, as a vegan celebrity and a leader in the vegan movement. So yeah, but the deeper underlying discontentment with the society is really, really fueling all that. So we've got a lot of Americans, I think, is most of the people in the audience, and they don't generally know a whole lot about Canada. Yeah. And um, I'm just kind of, and also this is for my own interest, can you kind of explain, uh, you've mentioned some animal and vegan sort of issues in, in what you're just saying there. I, I don't know, is that the core reason for your sort of dissatisfaction with uh, Canadian society? Or there's, to, if, to an American who knows yeah. nothing about these issues that bother you, can you kind of give us a little bit of a insight into what it is that... Sure. Is well, I mean, uh, for, for an American specifically, I think what I draw attention to is this. You Americans are very proud that you fought this revolution, that you wrote this constitution, 
and you had this civil war. In Canada, we had none of those three things. We never had the Revolution, we never had the Constitution, or, nor the Declaration of Independence. We never had the Civil War. And yet, isn't it remarkable how similar conditions are in the two countries in every imaginable way? Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. Do you yeah. know why, or do you have a theory on why that is? Yeah, I'm writing a book about it right now. <laughs> I'm on chapter three of my book. So yeah, it's actually it's something I've been, I've been meditating on a lot lately. And, and what I'm trying to point to is how misleading these political conceits are. And they're, I think in this case, I mean, what, I've, what I've just mentioned, I think these are political beliefs that people acquire in childhood. So they're very similar to religious beliefs. People start believing in the uniqueness of America and the American Constitution. It's like, well, okay, but if that's so unique... Why is it that Canada is kind of 98% the same, you know, in terms of the real lived experience day to day? Like, I don't know, walking around Seattle versus walking around Vancouver. It's walking around Toronto versus walking around New York City. Um, it's hard to spot the difference, especially talking about the political difference. What are the differences in, in political conditions? Uh, it's, it's very, very hard to, to pin down. So, no, uh, th th that would be kind of step one if I'm, if I'm talking to an American. And, you know, step two, you know, is probably to appeal to their, their awareness. Well, I come from a country that is built on genocide, on absolute cultural genocide. It's built on this British Empire system and this system of overtly undemocratic parliaments that we call a democracy, you know. And I'm a product of an education system that I consider absolutely abysmally terrible myself. So I'm in this position. And then I'll give a third step because it's only one sentence long. You know, one of the things I like to remind people of is, you know, I'm a Canadian citizen. My daughter is not. I made the conscious, intentional choice to refuse to allow my daughter to become a Canadian citizen. So, I mean, it's one thing if you say, like, just in kind of vague, nebulous terms that you're unhappy with Canada. But no, when I had the choice... Uh, that was the decision I made, is to put my foot down and say, no, I'm so, you know, these factors in Canada, they're so real, they're so important. I would rather have my daughter growing up in France, going into the French education system, and being part of a country that isn't built on genocide, and where they do have a very different uh, history of, of revolutions and civil wars, you can at least say. So do you feel that Canada is, as a country, is more um, guilty of, of this cultural genocide than America? Um, I think you can look at Canada, the United States of America, and Australia as imperfectly parallel cases. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's neglected from that conversation quite a bit. Oh, right, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. No, sure. I, I mean, you know, now in, in what ways is Canada worse, and what ways is Canada better? I wrote a very short essay once pointing out how remarkably similar even the treatment of Indigenous people was in Russia under Joseph Stalin. And that was specifically in the indigenous people who are way out east in Siberia and who are both genetically and linguistically related to our native people in Canada. Because that's, that's the history of where they came from. They look the same, they have the, the DNA has proved it, and their languages are related. And then you look at the forced assimilation, residential schools, slow motion genocide policies under Joseph Stalin. Now again, what does that tell you? Well, depending on how you look at it, you could say Canada's policies were just as bad as Joseph Stalin, or you could say Joseph Stalin's policies were so bad, they're almost as bad as Canada's, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the compar comparisons are odious. It's worthwhile, and you can learn things from, from those, uh, those contrasts. But one that always stuns me is I hear people claim that Japan is built on genocide against its native peoples. I've, I've done the research, I've done the history. I said, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, to me, that's not comparable at all, the history of, the internal history of Japan. J Japanese massacred other people that were conquered. Japan, Japan conquered Cambodia and Laos and stuff. They conquered Thailand. Different story. But, you know, um, so, no, I mean, th th the next question really is, you know, what are we doing in the comparison form? What are the conclusions we're trying to come to? It is definitely true that both Canada and the United States have a system of parliament you know, in one country called Parliament and one, one country called Congress. But we both have a system of Parliament that was designed to not represent the indigenous people from day one. And it still doesn't represent them. But obviously, if, if, you, or, if you or I traveled back in time and we started conquering North America, say, okay, well, we'll set up a Parliament 
And okay, so this is New York State at a time when 90% of the people are indigenous and 10% are these colonial settlers. What are you going to do? You're going to have a parliament that only represents the white colonial settlers. You're not going to give a seat. You're not going to give a voice to the indigenous people when the when they're the majority, you know. And then step by step, they're snuffed out. They're kicked off their land, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, they're extinguished. It's actually the American legal term. Extinguishment is the term used in American law. And um, there's no interest in even having seats for them when they're only 10% of the population. Like even when they're a tiny minority, there is still, there's still no place for them in your parliament, your Congress, your, your uh, state senate. So yeah, in that sense, uh, they're very comparable histories. In some ways a little bit better, in some ways a little bit worse. Here and there. So you mentioned that you sort of don't, yeah, I guess you're not really... Um, Feeling like you like this is the society that you. The, so I guess like okay, let me just. My question, I guess, in relation to the way you feel about Canada and how you don't really like, like you didn't want your daughter to be raised here. You you don't really like feel so great about the history and so forth. Is there and the, obviously the current politics? I imagine you've also got issues. Is there a country that you do feel like kind of more represents your ideals or where sure. you think you'd belong more? From yeah, sure. I mean, I can give you two examples, and they're both very imperfect. But of course, I feel much more positively about Switzerland, for example. Um, oh yeah, sure. No, in terms of actually having a real democracy, Switzerland is a really positive example. More of us should study. And I've always pointed out to my girlfriend, it just comes up in different contexts. Just even when the news, the news is openly saying, they'll just state as fact on the news that America is the wealthiest country in the world and has the greatest system of democracy in the world. It's like... America's not the richest country in the world. But I notice you're choosing not to compare yourself to, say, Luxembourg or Switzerland. I mean, there are countries in Europe that are much wealthier than the United States and also have a much better quality and depth of democracy. But to give an example that's a little bit closer to a third world country, but that's still tremendously appealing to me, uh, Greece. Greece is a deeply messed up country, you know, teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. So there isn't the wealth issue like Switzerland or Luxembourg would have you. But they care about democracy. They're the birthplace of democracy. They're never mentioned in these discussions. You know, it's never mentioned like, hey, Greece is a place that, that really matters. And um, I just say I've been to Greece. I don't have illusions that the Greek people are a bunch of philosophers. They watch football and they drink beer and they eat meat, a lot of lamb kebab. You know, I mean, I, there's a lot of things I don't like. I don't like the religion either. I don't like the Eastern Orthodox Christian religion or something. There's a lot wrong with Greece. But sure, um, I'm not comparing the United States of America to some kind of ideal. Uh, I feel that I'm comparing the United States of America to very palpable real examples. And I mean, two more real, real quick. I think everyone acknowledges this. Japan and Taiwan. South Korea is a pretty positive example too. But Japan and Taiwan are societies that reacted to being conquered by the United States of America by outdoing them. And in many, many obvious ways, both Japan and Taiwan are factually superior societies to the United States of America. Quality of education, crime rate, quality of democracy, you know, the, the, uh, quality of health care. The health care system in Japan or Taiwan compared to the United States of America. Um, so, no, and, and nobody... Okay, I can't say nobody. Incredibly few people are willing to just reflect on this and say, hey, the position of the United States of America in the world is not being the world's leader. And then the position of Canada following along behind America is therefore kind of one step back from America. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Cambodia for a minute. I know you've got a pretty deep uh, sort of history with that country. I want to ask you, how did you get interested in Cambodia? And it's possible the answer is my YouTube channel. But how how did you get uh, interested enough to watch them? Really, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, it was just a book I bought. It was it was some weird. It was called like the Four Horsemen, and it was like a really depressing sort of uh, photojournalism book. Mm -hmm. So this guy went to like multiple places. It was a book from the '80s. He went to uh, Lebanon and Cambodia and uh, Vietnam and a bunch of places, and it was just like essays about what horrors were happening and photos and um, I just remember like that I think that was the first time where I kind of was like reading about it and, and learning a bit about it and then I remember you know watching documentaries and learning about the carpet bombing and all this craziness that led to the Khmer Rouge and yeah and then I just kind of dug into it so 
But it's it's interesting to me because for people in the audience who don't know, you've you've lived there yeah. for, for a while. I understand, and I don't. I've heard you mention this, and, and I've and studied the language and all that stuff too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so I don't I don't know too much about it, and I'm kind of, kind of always been curious, like why Cambodia and when did that start? When did your interest start? And and what was the deal behind that you're Cambodian? Well, look, I'll just say, uh, I haven't asked you the parallel set of questions about how happy or unhappy you are in Canada. But if, uh, if you want to build your character a little bit, let me tell you, the future is in Cambodia and it's happening right now. So you're, you're a few years younger than me. Um, you, can, you, can, you could have a really interesting next decade of your life if you want to have a, a foothold in Cambodia. And of course, you don't have to be there 12 months a year. You could be there three months a year or six months a year. But um, today, in 2020, Cambodia is a much different place from what it was when I first went there. I will always remember um, I was wearing combat boots at that time with steel toe. I had to be ready to defend myself all the time. And I had my money in the soles of my boots. Um, you know, the big bills, you know. I, I forget, maybe I had $1,000 in cash on me, something like that. And it was in Thai currency in the soles of my boots. And I was, you know, kind of ready to go. Come, I, I came through uh, the jungle river route over land from the southeast corner of Laos down through and eventually, so down through a whole bunch of towns nobody's heard of and nobody cares about and where, of course, nobody speaks English. And uh, eventually ended up in the, in the capital city in, in Phnom Penh. And I'll always remember when I took the money out of my boots, the, uh, the heat had been so intense that the top bill on each side under the foot of my hand <laughs> was being ground into the boot had been ruined. So I lost like 2,000 Thai baht from the heat and the friction of carrying the money in the bottom of my boots. So I mean, it, it was rough back then. It's gotten less and less rough. And you know, it was a place where the greatest danger to you were the cops themselves. If you got a problem, not, you know. So I did get to see, I was there at the very end of the real Cambodia. And, you know, when there was no internet and no electricity and that stuff, you know what I mean? So if that's if that's what you're into, you know. How, uh, approximately how old were you? Then? God, like, sorry, great, great question. Without looking up, so what was it, 15 years ago? Some of that, right? So uh, my daughter is seven years old. So, yeah. I mean, well, well, I first got interested in Cambodia way back 2001. The first time I got the books out of the library and started studying the Cambodian language and the history of Cambodia was way back then. And I assumed I was going to start in Cambodia. I was like, okay, great. I'm going to get an English teaching certificate and I'm going to go out and do a combination of teaching English, historical research, humanitarian work, like volunteer for all the humanitarian work I can get and survive by teaching English. And uh, sorry, your audience won't know this. I wasn't just studying the modern language. I was also studying the ancient language, Pali. So Pali is the ancient scriptural language of Buddhist philosophy. So I was doing all that simultaneously. It was a very uh, intellectually stimulating uh, time in my life and maybe a somewhat emotionally deprived time in my life. You know, when I look back now, maybe I wasn't making the, the best decisions on my own behalf, you know, just in terms of my own self-interest. But nevertheless, um, so yeah, there's a combination of language, historical, humanitarian, all these, all these interests coming together, driving to Cambodia. But I first, uh, okay, so gee, how to make a long story short, I ended up first living in Hong Kong, then Taiwan, then Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, then uh, the capital city of Laos, Vientiane, then I had years in Laos, and much later ended up in Cambodia. So I did visit Cambodia before that, like before I, I actually lived there continuously, and Cambodia was always on my radar. I remember saying to people in Laos, you know, Cambodia feels big to me. Like it seems enormous and ancient and important. And when I'm here in Laos, everything seems small and trivial. And the, the history isn't as deep, uh, just in terms of centuries. There are not, many, not as many centuries of history. And the massacres aren't as big. I mean, you know, you've seen some, Cambodia, these are, this is mass murder on an unbelievable scale. The violence in Cambodia is just mind boggling. You know, in Laos, there's a little bit of violence. There is, you know, but it's, it's like the Smurfs compared to the land of giants. You know, Cambodia still had that quality. So I, I did eventually end up living and working in Cambodia. 
but not, it wasn't the first place I lived. It, it felt like it was the last place I lived. It was the end of a long, long journey of living and working for many years in Asia before I got to Cambodia. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so you were talking about, Lang so just quickly, why Cambodia? So well, like, I was going to say why Cambodia, but I guess it wasn't, it, you didn't just, my understanding right. was you had like specifically singled out Cambodia and you traveled there. Right. So you, you were just doing this whole kind of, Tour. No, so I, I did though. That's that's the interesting thing. So like when I was still in Canada uh, before I left for Asia, it was Cambodia that I chose. So I remember I, I had various university professors I talked to about this. I was looking for a language where I could combine my humanitarian interests. You could, to be blunt, my political interests, my interest in the reality of the world as it exists today, which has a lot to do with poverty and you know it has a lot to do with humanitarian concerns, but it's it's fundamentally political. Um, I wanted to be able to do that and then also work on the ancient history, the language, Buddhism as a philosophy and as a religion. I didn't want to be a philosopher cut off from political reality. I wanted to be a philosopher plunged into and really dealt with or drowned in, you know, contemporary political reality. I wanted to, I wanted to literally go out and get my, my feet wet, my hands dirty and work on the farms, work on a rice farm. Uh, you know, help people on your know, rice farm, you know, see, see whatever the state of the poverty and uh, anarchy in a pejorative sense was as these countries emerged in their post-war, you know, uh, squalor and so on, and see the consequences of the American bombing of these countries, they're full of craters, you know, that's a whole other aspect of the, of the story. But no, uh, I looked at many different options. I looked at Mongolia. I considered learning Mongolian. So you can imagine also Mongolia has some of those same factors. Mongolia used to be a communist country, Today it's a democracy, um, has a, a language, a modern language that is in some ways linked to an ancient language for Buddhist philosophy, but in some ways a totally different language. Um, you know, Mongolia presented a lot of the same um, opportunities and challenges, but no, it wasn't Mongolia that won. What I really decided was it was it was Cambodia for my own future. So yeah, already in Toronto before I left, I was writing up the Cambodian alphabet and I was learning to read Pali, the ancient Buddhist philosophy, in its Cambodian iteration in the Cambodian orthography. So yeah, I had all this stuff come together. And uh, sorry, look, and really briefly, again, I, your viewers know this, but both of my parents were communists. My mother and my father were communist extremists. So the history of Cambodia, it's one of those things where you hold up the mirror. Uh, you hold up the mirror to the reality of human nature. You hold up the mirror to the reality of civilization. But also, in my case, you're holding up the mirror to your own family, the excuses they made for mass murder. My parents were pro-violence. They were pro-revolution. They were pro-mass murder. And, you know, it's confronting them, and it's confronting my own childhood delusions, and then, you know, moving forward and trying to do something positive out of the ashes. So, yeah, for me, the significance of communism and mass murder in Cambodia is a little bit different because I grew up with a family who supported that who told me that it was good and right and justified. So, and for me, becoming an adult partly had to do with challenging and overturning my parents' values. So, yeah. Can we, I'd like to talk about that for a little bit, because that's do an aspect it. of you I'm interested in. Um, and, and, and communism in general is something I'm kind of interested in at the moment. Um, so, when you say they, ad, it's like they advocated for, you're, you're thinking specifically about like the Khmer Rouge, or like they were sympathetic to the communist uh, or the, yes. the Cambodian yeah. dictatorship? Yes. So the, the, the short answer is my parents were real communists. They supported the most extreme, most violent forms of, of communism. They weren't insincere, halfway communist. I'm not, I'm not saying that to insult anyone. Obviously, it would be morally superior to not <laughs> support mass murder. Um, but I guess you could say I had the advantage of not being raised with parents who were, well, put it this way, there's a difference between having parents who are, say, Holocaust deniers and having parents who admit that the Holocaust happened, who say, yes, it happened, but who supported it. Like, if you had parents who were actually Nazis, who worked for Adolf, maybe they worked in the concentration camp. A lot of people in Germany must have had parents or grandparents who actually worked in the, the concentration camps and actually supported it, right? Uh, like, if they're not denying it, that was positively what, what they were about politically. So it's a very, very different sort of thing. Um, but yeah, they, they supported the most brutal, most terrible excesses of communism. For example, in Tibet, um, they supported the destruction of Tibet by the Chinese Communist Party and destruction of uh, Tibetan culture and so on. So, you know, there was, no, uh, there was no sitting on the fence with them. And yeah, I mean, uh, that ideology is so simple 
that you can understand it as a child. I would say it's a childlike ideology. Um, but then you reach a fork in the road where it's like, am I going to keep making excuses for this the way my parents do? Am I going to pretend that things make sense that really don't make sense? Or am I going to, you know, acknowledge what's wrong and evil about this and start, you know, doing my own research and coming to my own conclusions? So was there a time, there was a time that you can remember when you were just kind of, let's say, indoctrinated by your parents and you, you were going along with it and you had kind of like an awakening yes. where you're like, wait a second. Yes, like, yes, like, yes. Like, yes. Well, and, you know, uh, one of the realest moments in my life to be not captured on video camera was me confronting my father about that a very short time before he died. My, dad, my father was basically on his deathbed. He had this condition that killed him in hospital very, very gradually. So it's not like he died that day, but still he was, he was in the bed where he was going to die. But, you know, I really confronted my father because he was in denial about it. And he was, he was claiming that, no, he hadn't indoctrinated me and hadn't raised me to be a communist. And I really had to passionately say to him, no, look, like this was my childhood. This is the reality of what I grew up with. This is what you taught me at the dinner table every night. And, um, you know, of course, it's quite common to meet people who were indoctrinated into, say, you know, Christianity, Islam, Mormonism, any of the, or, or a crazy cult religion. But the big difference is that when you're indoctrinated into communism as a child, you go out and look at the newspapers for sale on the newspaper stand, and you see Gorbachev, you see the Soviet Union, you see Mao Zedong, you see the stuff they're talking about, you see nuclear weapons. Like... It's not that the newspapers are saying the same things that my parents are saying, but the imaginary things my parents believed in, the outside world was always confirming to be real, that it was real, that it was a big deal, you know. So if you grew up in a crazy cult version of Christianity, any mainstream religion like this, or Hinduism, you know, you're training yourself as a child to believe in things you never see and things you never hear, but raising a child with communism, they're being trained to believe in things that they see all the time. You see it confirmed all the time. You know, you hear all the time that Cuba is this important country. Now, of course, my parents actually supported communist dictatorship in Cuba. Like, the news isn't going to do that. But still, you know, that's, that's being affirmed for you all the time, that, that Cuba is this real place that really matters. And in those days, of course, this is before 1989, also, if anything, the mainstream press was massively exaggerating the importance, the wealth, the success, the military power of those, uh, those communist countries. Do you... Um, wait, so, okay, so go back. Though, do you recall, was it a particular... Was there something, was there an incident, or was there something you saw or read about that made you kind of change your perspective on communism? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I would say the, the most important shift was during university and during my first year in university because at that point I was already too smart and too well informed to be a conv to really believe what my parents had taught me but like there was still the option of being kind of bullshit academic marxist and back then people used the term marxian like oh you're not marxist but you're marxian like I'm a like you're a sophisticated person who's still involved with this. So like the final you know turning point is like okay, am I still going to make some excuses to some extent and try to be a part of this intellectual tradition, or no? Am I really going to accept this is bad and evil and wrong? This really fundamentally is about justifying mass murder. It fundamentally is about justifying class struggle and refusing to allow democracy to exist. Like that's really a lot of what communism is about, is using violence to destroy democracy and then to perpetuate the regime after that. That's that's created that way. Um, so that that was that was really the most important turning point. But sure, earlier, I mean in terms of childhood or high school years, sure. There are there are a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of wake up points. And you know, of course, the easier road to have taken would have been to just not care about politics. I mean, that's, that's what you're not asking me. You know, I'm sorry, I'm not complaining. But I mean, I think a lot of people who are raised in the type of family I was raised in, they would respond to it by just concluding all politics is bullshit. I'm just going to stop caring about politics and I'm going to go party, you know, going to go do something else in my life or something. But I came to the conclusion that you know, politics really matter. Economics also really matters. I still really care about the study of economics. However, Marxist economics are complete bullshit. You know, that, that just the particular school of thought that I was raised in 
um, was was meaningless and worthless and bad. Yeah. I got a lot of follow-up questions. I need to take Great. a quick break. Though. Okay, I've, I've, cool. I have a lot to, of water to drink, so I'm just going to take a quick break. Yeah. Do you need to take a break, or do you want to do this? Hey, man, cue, cue the music. I don't know. Do you have an animated uh, segue? Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll put something. Folks, uh, we're talking about communism. Now, this is an interesting topic. This is a topic I've been kind of uh, thinking about and reading about and seeing certainly a resurgence, well, at least with my the, the channels that I am tapped into. I'm seeing a resurgence in... I guess I would say like the main, uh, not even yeah. the mainstreaming of it, but it seems like you know there was a time in the '80s or whatever where commie and communist, and before that as well, was just this very like you don't want to be that it's a bad thing. And slowly over time, it's like I don't know what it is exactly, but it seems like the general view on the on the concept is really softened. And now with a lot that's going on in the world, I'm seeing a lot of like I guess reinvigoration of people being interested in these ideas. And I suspect a lot of them don't quite understand exactly what the historical factors are and what it actually all leads to or has led to in many cases and stuff. So I kind of want to just um, talk about some basics because I feel like you have a, a lot more to say about communism and I'm pretty interested in the topic. So can we just start with the basics and like, can you tell me and these other folks in here, from your perspective, can, can you summarize communism into fairly simple terms as if you're explaining this to like a team. Sure, and I'm happy to do so. I just say uh, in case there are any communists or people who consider themselves communists watching this, you know, I do have a human heart. I can sympathize with their reason for being communists. Um, even though I am about to explain to you why communism is bad and evil and wrong. Um, there's a documentary right now on Netflix about a cult group and I haven't seen the documentary, but in the promo for it, what they mention again and again is that the reason people had for joining this cult, the reason they had for believing in this cult, was that they wanted to make the world a better place. They were trying to do good. And so the particular cult is called Nexium. I've heard that a lot from people who joined Scientology, and then Scientology destroyed their lives. So a lot of people go into these movements with genuinely good intentions. It doesn't mean it's a good movement. It doesn't mean what they did afterward was good. So I'm not impugning, I'm not insulting anyone's intentions. Even if some of you have literally signed up for and joined you know, communist parties, I know the types of intentions people had when they first got involved. And in the case of my own parents, obviously they were old enough that they remembered World War II and the Vietnam War, totally different political context. They, in their own minds, had good intentions but that led to them making excuses for terrible, evil things. The beginning of the story with communism is before Karl Marx. Communism existed as a concept and a movement prior to the career of Marx and Engels, although Marx is such a huge influence that we almost never talk about communism as it existed before Karl Marx. In the period before Karl Marx, actually a lot of the people who called themselves communists and communards were devout Christians. They were people who believed in refusing money. And a lot of them were actually influenced by a very famous book by Thomas More called Thomas More's Utopia. Thomas More's Utopia is one of the most influential books in the history of Western civilization. And uh, like, you know, if you haven't read it, you've read other authors who were influenced by it. Now, I would mention Thomas More's Utopia was even influential in Japan. It was even influential in communist China over Mao Zedong himself. Now, Thomas More's Utopia concludes with a condemnation of money, that the fundamental problem with society is money itself, that if we could have a society without money, we would have a paradise. And there were many different communist theorists. I'm saying theorists here because I'm really talking about people who wrote books, not the people who actually started communes, who are also interesting. And most of those people were crazy Christian fundamentalists, just like today. Like there were people who went away and said, okay, I'm going to start an ideal community. They were all, almost all spiritually guided people. But the people who were uh, in the city writing books, publishing, calling for revolution and, and profound economic change, um, a lot of them shared this apprehension that somehow money itself was the root of all evil. Karl Marx takes the decisive step of saying the problem is not money. 
The problem is money creating money, which he terms capital. So Marx's concept of capital, of capital investment, is that you reach a point in the development of society where the ruling class, the rich people, are no longer farmers, they're no longer soldiers, like in a Dark Ages sense or the Roman Empire or something, but that the rich people amass money and through things like the stock market, through investment and through gaining interest in the bank, money seemingly just produces more money and that this is the root of all evil. Um, so, okay, most fundamentally then, from the beginning, even before Karl Marx, you know, what is communism? Communism, in principle, is a rejection of economic reality for some other ideal. And that's why so many of the people involved are very idealistic. They may be Christian, they may be, you know, Jewish, Muslim, or what have you. It, it, generally, the impulse that unites communists together is the idea of, couldn't we just reject all of the cultural assumptions of our society? Couldn't we just go into the countryside and get some land and start farming and start out on our own and start out all over again? And people do that. You can live in a cave. You can start your own farm. And you start to encounter step by step all the facts of economics that communists wanted to ignore. You can make your own shoes. For everyone living on your commune to have handmade shoes using materials and labor within your commune isn't 10 times more expensive than shoes from a factory in China. It's not 100 times more expensive. It's 1,000 times more expensive. Now you've got a commune that refuses to buy anything and refuses to use money, and your children have no shoes. You know? So you know, how does your commune provide health care, so on and so forth? If you do this step by step, you're going to start learning the real facts of economics that all of the non-Marxist and non-communist thinkers have, have uh, embraced. So this is a short and I think fairly sympathetic uh, description of communism. The less sympathetic reality is that Marx invented and profounded this tenet, pardon me, tenet, this axiom, that all social progress, all change is accomplished through violence. And his philosophy, his path to communism, his path to progress, unlike even other theorists who were alive during the same generation with Marx, was to say that it's only through violence and then it's only specifically through the violence of the lower social class destroying the upper social class that history can progress and all kinds of other wacky ideas have sprouted up around that including the fundamental hostility to democracy that doesn't make a whole lot of sense so out of that we get with various steps in between the reality of modern communism which is still here with us on youtube today unchanged that what they need to do is form a vanguard fight a revolution kill the rich etc cetera, etc cetera. this is the unbelievably ugly reality of communism again you see on twitch you see on youtube you see everywhere and it's important to keep in mind that contrast wait a minute guys didn't this start with us as teenagers thinking we could go in the countryside and buy a plot of land and start farming and make our own shoes and not have to use money didn't this start with i mean today people don't read thomas More's utopia they don't anymore centuries ago they did but didn't this start with some kind of utopian ideal in that sense, in Thomas More's Utopia, that we can do better than the society, we can get rid of the greed and oppression of the society? And then you have the unbelievably oppressive and terrible reality, not just of what communism is as a, as a government, but what communist revolutionary movements are in 2020 here and now. All right, let me, uh, interesting, let me, uh, I wanna kind of feed that back to you a bit through my own filter and let me and I want you to let me know if you think I'm getting stuff wrong or what I want to hear what you have to say about this. So is it from my perspective, both from what you're saying and just from my previous understanding of it, communism is a response to bad conditions, generally, right? It's like communism wouldn't have come up if utopia already existed. As you just you're kind of describing it with this book as, as having sort of utopian roots. And maybe even not beyond roots, it's it's it seems to be a utopian philosophy. Was yes. that, would you say that's correct? Yes. Uh, Political philosophy. Yeah, and the, the very earliest phases of communism, which still to this day communists go back to, is the contrast between Athens and Sparta. This is still, still the, it's in Marx, but in general, you're going to find it in Marx, Lenin, Stalin, you're going to find it in all kinds of, you're going to find it even in the critics of communism, talking about communism as the new Sparta. The idea that Sparta was a society with no money, 
where nobody ever touched money, where nobody ever bought things, is completely false. It's a fiction, but it was a widely believed fiction. And the idea that whereas Athens had democracy, but it was a society built on commerce and greed and democracy, you know, it was kind of the capitalist democracy, but that Sparta represented something pure, um, uncontaminated by the use of gold coins and this kind of thing, that there was this alternative way to build a society. I don't think any of them would quite say Sparta was a utopia, but it is a utopian way of thinking about Sparta, and that's still with us, yeah. So that, that contrast, amazingly, has for more than 2,000 years come up again and again. It's been reinvented again and again, yeah. Okay, so, so it's a response to bad conditions. So another thing I want to mention for people who don't know. Hey, you, all kinds of people who are communists here on YouTube live in wonderful conditions. I don't even, I, I don't even presume that. I mean, people are living, living happy bourgeois lives um, in California, and they become communists. There, there are people in Switzerland who become communists. So no, I think that idealism, it can appeal to people who are born rich. It can, it can appeal to all kinds of people. Sure. Okay, but wouldn't, wouldn't that, if those people that are, say, born rich, that are sympathetic with communism, wouldn't that spring from a sense of solidarity or empathy for those people that are under bad conditions generally? Isn't it usually right. like somehow connected to that? So great, great question. And I say, I'm not trying to demonize anyone here. Um, one of the major leaders of the uh, Cambodian Communist Party who went on trial um, recently, he went on trial just a few years, like during my lifetime, um, you know, uh, his name is pronounced Doik. Yeah, I watched the film about him. Okay, great. So Comrade Doik, as he's remembered, you know, when he was asked, why did you decide in the first place to become a communist? He gave the most honest answer you're ever going to hear. He had a bad week where he confessed to a girl that he was in love with her. She'd been something like a, a classmate. She'd been somebody he'd known for a long time. And she laughed at him and rejected his advances. And his bicycle was stolen. And he was standing there with his bike lock or whatever, where his bicycle used to be. He was standing there looking for his stolen bicycle. And he thought, this society is bad and evil and wrong. There's got to be a better way. And he packed up and left the city and joined the Communist Party, which at that time meant he joined armed rebels with guns in the jungle. And he ended up you know, torturing people to death for the regime. As you, as you may know, he went on to commit terrible atrocities for that regime. So, you know, I'm not saying that to ridicule everyone. A lot of us will know what it's like to have their bicycle stolen. A lot of us will know what it's like to be rejected by a girl you've got a, got a crush on. Um, you know, obviously my own parents provided me with a case study, but I mean, their reasons for embracing communism, I see as very human in this sense. And, and, and to be self-critical, like my reasons why I got involved with Buddhism would be, would be very human in the same way. You know, I, 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 I do sympathize with those reasons. But put it this way, I think absolutely nobody gets involved in communism because they, in a detached way, read Karl Marx's economic theories and think this is the way to help the poor. Nobody in their right mind could do that. You'd be much more likely to join the Catholic Church if you wanted to help the poor. And I say that as someone who, who is not Catholic and doesn't support the Catholic Church. So I had this, this is a little anecdote, but I had a friend, a really close friend of mine who briefly, this is ages ago when I didn't really even have an opinion, but I remember him sort of talking about communism and he was in a really bad place, like his job was terrible and he was just really frustrated with society. And I remember that was the moment, I never heard him talk about it after, but there was just like a week or something where I heard him talking about it and just, thinking like, wouldn't it be great if this and this and this, and we all had the same thing, we all, you know, we're all getting, I didn't have to struggle. And yeah. So like, that's kind of how I've always identified it as, in general, obviously there's exceptions all over the place, but in general that communism is attractive to people that are disenfranchised with things like capitalism and just the state of society. And for that reason, it's not as common for somebody who's, let's say, comfortable in life to really identify with this. Well, I'd say it depends on what kind of ego you've got. When you believe in something like communism, and those in the audience can think about how many other kind of hippie beliefs today are like this also, all of a sudden you believe in this secret magical truth that makes you feel superior to your own school teachers, that makes you feel superior to your boss at work, that makes you feel superior to your own parents and grandparents. You, you get it, and they don't really get it, man. They don't really know what's going on. 
A lot of conspiracy theory thinking is like this. So that can be extremely appealing to the ego, again, depending on, on what kind of character you are. In my father's case, um, you could say he was a failed actor, or he was someone who had a very small amount of success as an actor. He did earn his living as an actor for a couple of years. He cared a lot about getting attention from women. Good reason to be an actor, by the way. Don't do it for the money. You know, he cared a lot about being important and being the center of attention. And immediately before my father became this extreme communist, he was a Christian extremist. He had a period of being a so-called Christian existentialist preacher. So there are some people who will switch from one cult belief to another because that cult belief serves the same function for their ego, right? Like, hey, you know, do you want to know what it is to be saved? You know, here's this preacher who's going to tell you how things really are, the secrets of the universe, the afterlife, whatever it is. They have the invisible key that unlocks these mysteries you've never understood. Communism really does that for people. And I think that's exactly why it's having a resurgence now, when in every other way it's been totally discredited. So just to give a really short example, I mean, you asked about this kind of thing earlier. When I was a kid, my parents presented communism to me. And I just assumed, oh, so communists have a better way of organizing farms. I was very interested in farming, not worth saying why. And like the minute I went to the library and got a book explaining how farms were organized in the Soviet Union, it was like, is this a joke? Like, <laughs> this is much, much worse. And by the way, these books were pro-communist. These were not, you know, these were not like indictments. It was like, this is unbelievably worse than the way agriculture is organized in Canada, England, France, Italy, or, or you name it. Like, you know, so there's this promise that this is the secret of the universe. But if we ever look at just empirical reality, how farms work, why people were starving to death in, in communist countries, and even when they weren't starving, that the farming system was, you know, really more awful than feudalism. Um, you know, that puts the lie to that optimism. But it appeals to human optimism and it appeals to this kind of ego trip, letting you feel that you're superior to your own school teachers. Okay, so Lychean's in the chat a little while back was kind of asking for some clarity on uh, this definition. Because it's a hard thing to pin down, uh, com what communism is. And I think there's also like a lot of this stuff, it's an element of subjectivity, it's we're interpreting it to a degree. But one of the questions she asked is about the differentiation between personal... Uh, and private property. Right. Now, from what I understand, and I'll let you explain this because I'm sure you know more about this particular thing, my understanding is that communism is intrinsically against private property. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is true. Um, you know, Marxism per se basically says, so I mean, Marxism is a more narrow category than communism. There are many types of communism, but Marxist Orthodox communism basically says that what they want to take away is ownership of the means of production, a term you're going to hear a lot if you're getting into communism. Mm -hmm. So that would mean ownership of the machines that are used in assembling a car, ownership of the factory, ownership of the farmland, ownership of the tractors that are on the farmland, but individual people can still own toys for their children, they can still own clothing for themselves. Um, it's not a total prohibition on, uh, on owning tangible things in your own home. It's not quite as monastic as that. Okay. Uh, with, with that having been said, though, any group of communists who are really serious and sincere about getting rid of money entirely, they pretty much do eliminate anything you can own. And Cambodia is a great example of that. I mean, really, in Cambodia, nobody owned anything. Um, the, the extent of the poverty people were reduced to it's it was kind of as close as maybe as close as we've come in the 20th century to people not owning anything aside from the clothes on their back a kind of omni slavery where almost everybody except the leadership of the communist party was was really in a state of slavery yeah so <clears throat> i think a lot of people probably myself included or at least in the past more so kind of have a hard time understanding the differences between like Marxism and right. Leninism and communism and socialism and all these things. And maybe let's not get into that because it's such a huge topic. <laughs> so just to, let's just make it clear that we're, we kind of have to generalize a bit, I think, when we're talking about this stuff. Like yeah. you've kind of mentioned like strict Marxist communism, these other right. things. But could do you think you could somewhat succinctly explain Marxism versus communism versus socialism? 
Uh, sure. Okay. So let's do them in the reverse order. All right. Socialism is about debating where we draw the line between the public sector and the private sector. So in some countries right now, if you pick up a phone and make a phone call, many countries around the world, the actual phone service is provided by the government. So this is to say the government actually built the wires that connect your phone call to other people. You are using a government service. You may even get a phone bill from the government or it could be provided to you for free. In many countries around the world, you may be getting electricity provided to you by the government. You may be getting water, healthcare, many, many things are in the public sector sphere. And let's be clear, public means government. That's what it means. So it's kind of a euphemism to say public sector instead of government sector or state sector, or another really blunt term is the command economy. All right, now why is it command? Because ultimately it tends to resemble the way the military is run. If the government has its own electricity company, it's not that different from working for the military, working for the government's electricity company, as opposed to working for a private company. So uh, again, within Canada, even within the last 50 years, a lot of those things have shifted around. What things are uh, public utilities, government, what things are... So socialism fundamentally and simply is a debate about where do you draw that line. Communism, really by definition, means that you want to draw the line as far as possible to one side of the chart, as far as possible to the left, I guess you could say, so that almost nothing is private sector. Now again, as I just mentioned, Marxists will say, hey, you can still own clothes, you can still own toys for your kids, you can still do stuff in your private life, but um, they would not, a communist by definition does not want private ownership of a car factory, a tractor, anything like that. So when you start with the definition of socialism, now, so right now in the United States of America, a socialist like Bernie Sanders is saying, hey, he wants to move the line so that the whole healthcare system becomes government. It's now debatable. I'm not going to get into the details of exactly what Bernie Sanders is promising because anyway, that is probably the reality of what Bernie Sanders promises, even if he doesn't, doesn't really say that. Um, and, you know, fair enough. Many countries in Europe, they have moved the line where, you know, the, you know, healthcare is a government service. And then to see communism as putting the line all the way over. Um, and then I think, you know, very simply, you know, Karl Marx is just one author, but he is the single most influential author, you know, in, in de the development of modern communism. I mean, you know, who today is really talking about uh, Louis Auguste Blanqui? So Louis Auguste Blanqui, while Karl Marx was alive, he said, they are the real communists that Blanqui and his followers, they were the real communists, unlike Karl Marx and Engels, that they weren't real communists. <laughs> it's an interesting quote. So there were other communist leaders with other ideas about, about communism and who were also going out and making revolution. Louis Gus Blanqui, he spent a lot of his time in prison. Um, and he ended up dead, but I guess all of us do eventually anyway. Uh, so there were other names, there were other people you can read. But the, the significant footnote about Karl Marx is that he presented himself as an economist and what he has to say about economics is just horseshit. I, I think that's a relatively succinct answer. <laughs> okay, interesting. So I want to, can I give you, I want to like kind of give, give like a breakdown of my understanding of what happened with the Russian Revolution as sure. just like a case study to, to what happens with communist revolutions. And I want to get your perspective if I'm summarizing, if you think I'm summarizing it accurately, if you think I'm missing something. Because um, this is something I've been pretty interested in lately, the Russian Revolution. So like my, my general, and, and it, it seems like this is parallel to other revolutions, communist revolutions that have happened, similar sort of outcomes have occurred. But my understanding is that it's, it starts with discontent. And in Russia, it was sort of the oligarchy, I think you would say, just sort of the ruling, the powers that be at the time, which where it was like a monarchy mixed with some sort of uh, pretty uh, totalitarian uh, government, I think, and they didn't have a lot of freedom. You weren't allowed to practice politics openly, for example. There's all these restrictions. It was a very repressive society. A lot of reason to look for a utopian ideal. And then slowly this, this Karl Marx stuff and the communism started bubbling up, and the idea was, look at these capitalists and, the, and these rulers being such assholes. Um, we need to take them down. And then, and then we take them down and take down the system of capitalism, we'll be able to figure out something better than it. We'll, we'll, even though we don't have all the background and all the systems and everything set up in place, 
we'll be able to create everything new, more or less. We'll, we'll, we'll do it better, surely. And then they were able to convince people of that. They were able to sort of violently do that and take over, more or less. And then once they did, all these utopian ideals were sort of put, like, they were forced to, like, okay, now you got to actually do all these things that you were talking about. And that's where things went to absolute horror because it turned out that they did not have these abilities. And so it led to sort of administrative, administrative catastrophe, let's say, all of these multitudes of examples, famines and what have you. Right. Um, various classes were demonized and murdered and all these things and replaced with less competent people, which led to sort of long-term economic and human catastrophe. And similar sort of stuff has happened in other countries. That's, so that's just my brief understanding of, it's really summarized of Russia. And again, it, I think it parallels a lot of other sort of communist revolutions that I've looked at. But I wonder, am I getting stuff wrong from your perspective? Yeah, I, I would disagree with the first chapter of what you said in terms of the origins. I don't think we disagree much with the disaster that comes after in chapters four, five, and six or whatever. But maybe the first three chapters I would disagree with you about. Um, in many, many ways, the decades leading up to the revolution were a very optimistic time in Russia. The sense in which they were not an optimistic time can be summarized with one word, war. So Russia was involved in a series of really terrible wars. Actually, you know what? Keeping all the way real, war and genocide. So there's genocide going on too, which is kind of another story. But with the significant exception of war and genocide, it was a period of tremendous optimism about the future. And keep in mind, the world was a small place it wasn't difficult for Russians to go back and forth between their own rather backward country and places like Germany and France, and they really could see how quickly they could catch up with uh, where Western Europe was already at. And the technology, the, the pace of technological change was tremendous at that time. Russia also had this unimaginably enormous empire. Uh, stretching all the way east of Vladivostok and beyond. I mean, never forget they had a land border with Japan and so on. You know, so no, there was a time of, of, of tremendous optimism in many, many ways, and you could even say that optimism led into uh, the transition to communism. However, uh, they had a problem with losing wars, and at that time, the main war they were losing was the one with the Germans but they also had war with Poland and many other um, aggressors. Uh, certainly, their problems with Japan never ended until the end of World War II. So they had war with Japan, they had war with, they had wars to control Korea with China. So it was this enormous empire. You know, they had wars about um, the control of uh, Alaska and Hawaii. There were Russian colonies in Hawaii. This was an unbelievable world empire that's forgotten. Um, that Russia really, I'm, you know, I'm not glorifying it, but yeah, the British Empire took over a lot of the world. Well, the Russian Empire, they took over a lot of the world in that period also. And in, indeed, part of that optimism, just to keep in mind, it just has to do with things like the discovery of electricity. You know, just say, they, it's not that they invented it, but society was changing and modernizing in this, in this inspirational way. And the Russians saw the way in which they could improve. You could say some of these same things about Japan during this period of time, in terms of optimism. Um, what you can never forget is this. Before the Bolsheviks took over, there were elections, and the Bolsheviks lost. So even Wikipedia will give you the election results. So there was all this optimism. They deposed the royal family of the Tsar, and then they had this transition, relatively peaceful transition, considering they were at war continuously during this time. They had this transition to having uh, democracy, elections, and a parliament. And the winner of the elections was called the Socialist Revolutionary Party. They were a far-left party, but not as extreme as the Bolsheviks, not violent communists, not insane Marxists. They were socialists, and you can tell from the name, they weren't even moderate socialists, they were far-left Socialists. The whole history of Russia would be different if Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, could have just accepted his role as one of the minority parties in politics and sat in parliament and gave speeches and debated what the future of Russia could be. But that's not what they did. The Bolsheviks 
hunted down and murdered every single member of parliament. They hunted down and murdered everyone who voted to support the Socialist Revolutionary Party, who were a very large percentage of the population. The unbelievable violence of what's normally referred to as the Russian Civil War rather than the Russian Revolution, really it's the same thing or two periods of time and the same thing. Um, that violence is so extreme because the elections proved the vast majority of the population were anti-Bolshevik. They were against the Bolsheviks, even though they did. They were optimistic in general about left-wing ideas of making rapid progress, of having some kind of change in society. What they wanted was to have a pluralistic socialist democracy similar to the ones they were familiar with at that time already in Western Europe. And that's not what they got. Instead, they got the dictatorship of Lenin. Lenin gets shot in the head. Um, he doesn't die right away from being shot in the head, but he knows his days are numbered. He's never really the same again after he gets shot in the head. Lenin writes his will, and, you know, the next guy in the commander's seat is Stalin. And Stalin is so terrible that people seem to remember Lenin as if he wasn't too terribly bad. But, in fact, Lenin was absolutely unbelievably <laughs> terrible, too. So, yeah, that's my way of telling the story. And, I mean, the, the big difference is putting the emphasis on that, on that election. And the election tells you a lot about communism and the way in which it is based on the refusal to accept the vote of 50% or 51% of the population. And it's accepting the violence of having a small minority force everyone else into a totalitarian system run by communists. So me and you know the sort of aftermath. I don't know if, who's watching right now, but for those who don't, once this regime, Stalin and his regime sort of took over. So the Bolsheviks, for those who don't know, Bolsheviks was that was the party the, the, at the time that took over. Eventually, the Bolsheviks became just the Communist Party, I believe. Uh, yes, yeah, they continued using both terms, but yeah, sure, Bolsheviks or the Communist Party, yeah, sure. So like a lot, a lot of horrible things happened, but I mean, I, I, one of the biggest ones was was the um, coll collectivization of agriculture. Yeah. So they, there was this, no, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there was this notion that they needed to like jump forward technologically and that the way to do that was let's collectivize all agriculture in Russia. Let's kind of put all the farms together essentially and control them like from the top down rather than ha them having independence. Yeah. And so that was the plan. And then the way that they enforced that was to single out somewhat competent, profitable farmers and murder and torture them and replace them with less competent people, yeah. leading to an atrocious famine where hundreds of millions, tens of millions, if not a hundred million, I don't know the exact numbers, yeah. but many, many millions of people starved to death and many millions of people right. nearly starved to death and had all kinds of consequences after. And it's really one of the most grotesque things I've ever read about or heard about. Um, and yet nobody seems to know about it in just modern day Canada and, and America. <clears throat> so what I'm leading to, well, for, let me start there. Did, did I get anything horrendously wrong? <laughs> oh, I, no, I agree. I think we agree on chapters four, five, and six. We agree with that stuff, yeah. By the way, I didn't disagree with... What, I know, I know. It was, it was really like a lack of community because I guess... Sure. No, it's a huge challenge. To summarize something this enormous is a huge challenge. And I, I don't think anyone else summarizes it the same way I summarize it. I have total respect for you. Go on. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, I've read the Gulag Archipelago, and I've read a bunch of stuff about that era, so about the famine in Ukraine and all these other things. And it's, it's haunted for – I've read that a while ago, and I've sort of been re getting into this topic with the Stalin biography that I've been reading. And it really, like – resonated with me and kind of horrified me initially just that it happened and now I'm getting a little I, I guess like do you see any parallel what I'm getting to is do you see any parallels to that that Russian revolution and the, the events preceding it to what's going on in America right now and do you think it's do you, th am I, do you think I'm reaching to have a sort of abstract concern that some other kind of hostile takeover with yeah. horrendous ramifications could be uh. You know, the differences are certainly more striking than the similarities. What, what's most troubling to me about the United States of America is that we've got another period of history in which people seem to think that being right is the only thing that matters. Um, so, in other words, people put a lot of emphasis on moral superiority rather than, say, having a pragmatic attitude to talking a problem through and looking at different approaches and trying them out and seeing what works. So what you've just said about transforming agriculture in Russia, 
if you had, you know, 50 people in a room and you just sort of asked, okay, what do you think we can do to transform agriculture in Russia? And you got some suggestions. And then you had a pragmatic attitude like, okay, well, let's try that on a couple of farms and let's try that in a couple of farms and let's meet up again in six months and talk about how it's going and if something's not working. Like, you know, <laughs> improving agriculture doesn't have to involve mass murder. Like, it's, it's so, it's so mind-blowingly obvious. And you could say this day about improving education or something. But there's a tyrannical attitude that begins with, I'm morally right, I'm morally superior to everyone else in the room. Anyone who's going to question my judgment and my decision on this deserves to even be imprisoned or tortured and so on. And then that proceeds from there logically and takes what might be a kind of harmless idea about how to improve, agric improve agriculture and enslaves and ruins the lives of enormous numbers of people, you know, force them to do this in, in, a, in a tyrannical way. <laughs> And I, I just say, I mean, I'm using agriculture as an example because it's so banal. It's so, it, it's so boring. It's so uninteresting. There's nothing dramatic about improving agriculture. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, I would say the only thing or the main thing I can see that Americans in 2020 have in common uh, with the revolutionaries of that era is this sense that what matters is my personal moral superiority, is that I'm right and that my being right entitles me to, um, you know, a, a kind of carte blanche um, totalitarian agenda. I do think that's a widespread sentiment uh, in American culture. And I would say you even see that in things like the approach to global warming. Um, you know, the people once who have adopted this attitude that they're morally superior because they're trying to save the world and you're not. Uh, I see that playing out. But otherwise, I think there were very, very few um, similarities. One that I, I draw people's attention because you can forget it, almost all of the extreme protests we've seen implicitly amount to protesters demanding that the government solve their problem for them, saying, we want the government to do this, we want the government to do that, we want the government to do a better job. That's fundamentally unrevolutionary. You know what's revolutionary? Is when you get out and solve the problem for yourself and you say you don't need the government. It's much more dangerous. You know, so I don't see anyone in the political spectrum, you know, in any significant numbers, left, right, or center, uh, who are doing anything other than complaining and expecting the government to solve their problems for them. Uh, and and to, to give a really simple example, you know, drug addiction. So people sometimes protest, they want the government to do this or that about drug addiction. When people start just doing it, when people start saying, hey, we know the solution to drug addiction, we're going we're gonna to do it. We don't need the police. We don't need the government. That's revolutionary, and that's that's more dangerous. Interesting. So the the uh, the other side of this issue for me, because I've I I've, I've felt like uh, especially at reading I'm, I'm literally reading about the Russian Revolution right now and Stalin taking power and all this stuff like that. So it's on my mind, and I'm I'm drawing these parallels, but I'm also really questioning these parallels. And I've also been noticing that a lot of uh, let's say Republicans or whatever. Are talking about communism as the new, as like another boogeyman, basically. Where I'm like, I'm just seeing different things where people are like, oh, the Democrats are communists, they're gonna take a kind of like an extreme version of what I was just sort of mildly proposing yeah. could be a concern, or whatever. But I'm seeing it sort of being talked about, like, and, and I'm wondering, do you think that that thing that I described, the, par the, you know, the parallel that somebody might draw, do you think that that could be used as a sort of way of weaponizing or sort of weaponizing communism as a way of like demonizing the left from the, from the right? Where they could go, oh, you guys better not watch out for these activists on the right. They're going to, yeah. you know, it's going to be like Russia all over again or whatever. Do you, do you feel like that's a narrative that could be pushed forward? Uh, so, you know, I saw a video recently on Sargon of Akkad's YouTube channel. I very rarely look at Sargon of Akkad. And he was in exactly this way demonizing the far left as as if they were already an armed revolutionary force um, taking over the government and this kind of thing. So it was, it was exactly the type of thing you've described without repeating what you've just said. You could call it red baiting or fear mongering about the far left. And the example he gave to prove his point, a quote from a live stream, I think it was on Twitch, uh, of a group of these communists who are pretty famous on, on YouTube. It was four people talking while playing the massively multiplayer online game Fall Guys. And 
not body shaming anyone here, but these were fat, lazy people playing a video game and, you know, chatting over live chat while they were doing it. And yes, there was some revolutionary rhetoric in there, but it's like, Sargon, I think you're kind of missing the forest for the trees here. Like, the main thing to recognize is that these are fat, lazy, video game addicted people who are sitting around saying stuff that reinforces their own sense of moral superiority. And what I've just said about the far left, you could say about so many people on the far right. You know, people on the far right, they're playing video games too. They're smoking marijuana too. They're doing cocaine and sleeping with prostitutes and living this life of total self-indulgence. Um, you know, like I, I mentioned, you know, part of what made Cambodia so violent is just that Buddhist background. And to come back to Doik, whose story you've already known, Comrade Doik, who went on to torture huge numbers of people. Uh, that was his job. He was a full-time professional torturer, what do you want to say? <laughs> you know, uh, when he made that decision, somebody stole his bicycle and he thought that's the last straw, he's going to go and join the revolution. He came from a cultural background and personal background where he thought he could put on a backpack and walk barefoot into the jungle and really live with personal hardship, really sleep under a mosquito net, you know. I, I have some experience in that climate, in those jungles, sleeping under a mosquito net. I remember a friend of mine who was a Buddhist monk said, uh, uh, what white people don't understand is that the forest is not quiet here. <laughs> There's the noise of wild animals all night. You know, the animals are really active through the night in the tropics, you know. But, you know, just that kind of resolution, just that image of being a man who's willing to go and live in a cave, you know, that did, that did draw on the Buddhist background. And I'm not saying it's a good thing. I mean, it's part of why it was so violent and so extreme. The people I see, whether on the left or the right, um, you know, they're soft. And they're soft because they're addicted to video games, they're addicted to drugs. This is their life, this is who they really are. I don't put that on as like a footnote. I think that's integral to who they are. And um, that makes a lot of those debates, you know, just seem kind of silly and ridiculous, in my honest opinion. Okay. So that kind of leads me to the next question, which uh, is kind of about like, I mean, there's so many different issues going on right now. Um, big issue, like, you know, we don't even think, the election, there are things, all these, all these kind of like talking points in relation to it, healthcare and a million different things that are, a lot of people are talking about. And I feel like it's hard for the average person to distinguish which of these issues are important and which of these are just kind of like, almost just like PR, just people kind of inserting things into the narrative that are into the news cycle or whatever that, so I wonder from your perspective, you know, we've, we've kind of just identified in your, in your opinion, the, the far left extremists, let's say, aren't, you don't consider them to be too much of a threat due to their general softness. Um, what do you think is a threat? Like, what, what are you concerned about? And of all these things going on, what do you sort of prioritize as like one of the major issues that you, you're kind of looking at with a bit of a worry? Yeah, so look, uh, th this would be a great one to do as a final question because this, this is perfect. This perfectly brings us back to like the first questions you asked me. What I'm worried about is stasis. What I'm worried about is complacency. What I'm worried about is conformity. What I'm worried about is the perpetuation of the status quo. Um, so I have friends who ask me this kind of question and some of them kind of ask me like, what do you think the worst case scenario is if Trump gets reelected? And I sit back, for me, the worst case scenario is that everything stays the same. For me, because as I said at the very beginning, I am a dissident. I am a radical. In many ways, I'm more radical than Bernie Sanders. I'm not a status quo person. Politically, I'm just a very pragmatic, down-to-earth person. I'm not an idealist. I'm not an ideologue. But the kind of pragmatic change I want is connected to my profound dissatisfaction with the society. So like, just, to, just to give like a really brief example, because it may seem too abstract, like some people complain university is a ripoff. Very common, very common sense. All right. But I am someone who is not just complaining when I say university is a ripoff. University is an experience at the core of the formation of people's identity in this society. Uh, they're putting them on their career path. It changes people's lives. And I see the university system as something that is changing people's lives for the worse 
that is kind of bankrupting society as a whole, that is making beggars of us all. Like, yeah, I, I, I think the university system, system is, a, is a ripoff, but I really want to do something about it. I don't want to just smoke marijuana and play video games, right? I mean, it may seem shallow, but if you really actually want to change the education system, when you really actually want to change the world, then you start to become a dissident. So for me, the, the, greatest, the greatest danger is that nothing changes. When I did an evaluation, this is now four years ago, something like that, three and a half years ago, when I did an evaluation of the Trump tax cuts, there were all these left-wing people who were saying that the Trump tax cuts were so terrible, there was such an economic disaster that was going to bring about the downfall of American democracy. And I did the math. You know, I have a background in both political science and economics. And looking at the numbers, I said, nope, that's wishful thinking. The Trump tax cuts, they're bad, but they're not bad enough to change anything. You, know, like you can have the Trump tax cuts and everything can keep on going the same way it's been before. People do this same kind of wishful thinking um, about climate change, that somehow we're facing a crisis so grave, so profound, so obvious that it's going to force a radical transformation of our society. People do the same thing. I talked about this recently with veganism and your health. Like, oh, the health effects of eating meat and drinking milk are so bad that it's going to force this transformation of society. No, nothing's going to force it. Society is going to change when people are positively motivated to make a change and no sooner. We can go on having one bullshit, you know, uh, president after another, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama, Trump. We can go on bombing Afghanistan forever and never go bankrupt and never improve democracy and never learn the lessons of history. It is totally possible to sustain the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war and the current levels of deficit spending forever and ever. It's, the revolution isn't going to happen by itself. Like there aren't some, there isn't some powerful force that's going to transform our society. You and I, we now watching this YouTube video, we have to make the change. Why did the French Revolution happen? A, a revolution that the communists rarely claim. Some do. Why did the French Revolution happen? Right? Didn't happen because of poverty. Right? The 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 so-called poor people in Paris were the most privileged people in all of France. France itself was the wealthiest, most opulent country in all of Europe. Economically, everything was going great. The French Empire was doing better and better. The French Revolution happened in the way that it did, when it did, because people actually had new ideas. They actually had new ideas and aspirations to make a better society. You know, And some disasters ensued and some massacres ensued. But yeah, you know, people get new ideas. They get motivated to make the world a better place. And then things change, you know, something, something happens. In reality, you know, the Constitution of Canada was written during my lifetime. It's called the, the Patriation of the Constitution. It's not some ancient document people look up to as something sacred and hallowed the way Americans do. In France, their Constitution was written after World War II. But we have these deeply conformist attitudes that nothing can change, that no better society is possible, not even to the extent of being willing to look at Denmark and Switzerland. You know, look, it's, a, it's already radical to say, hey, we have something we can really learn from Denmark. We can do something better to look at these examples. Or Japan or Taiwan and say, hey, there's something we can learn from other countries and other cultures. We really can fundamentally do better for our citizens and we can do, do better people. So no, for me, you know, the, the greatest threat to the status quo is just the continuation of the status quo. Um, we can have another president like George W. Bush or like Obama who fundamentally changes nothing at all. Um, you can't look at the systems we have in place right now, whether Parliament or United States Congress, uh, to bring about this kind of change. We have to look to ourselves. And by my own definition, as I've already said, that does make me a radical, that does make me a dissident, that does make me someone who is perhaps a little bit more dangerous uh, than Bernie Sanders. <laughs> That doesn't have to be the last question. If you want to end it there, it's great. Or if you want to switch topics, I'm happy to talk about anything at all. Uh, something I say to people, because I, I get asked questions about starting a YouTube channel, but I always say, you know, the most important thing is just to have something to say 
that you come on cam don't come on camera and tell your audience oh hi guys i've kind of had a busy week i don't have anything to say then don't make that video come on camera when you're passionate come on camera when you have something to say when you have a story to tell and you know i'd like to think the rest takes care of itself but anyway thank you and look man thank you for taking the time thank you for sharing my life because in just the last couple of years that's the reality is if you watch my videos you know me better than my own biological brother you know me better than my own parents did you know you know me better than people who think they know me because what i'm sharing on my channel is who i really am it's what i really yeah. care about it's my real life i mean i feel like i do kind of know you like because you, you yeah you, you talk about a lot of aspects of your life and stuff so i know i know a thing or two yeah. but um well actually sorry just one someone in the, i don't this is a quick one just one in the chat's asking is the french education system more like the uk's than the u.s slash canada's uh, no, I, I think a really short answer is that the, the French education system is totally, totally, totally different. Um, so I'll give, a, I'll give a short answer about that, but it is interesting to me. So my girlfriend has now visited France with me four times because my daughter is uh, living and going to school in France. And I used to have uh, visitation rights and custody rights, and I now have a bunch of lawyers instead. But anyway, when we were going to France to visit my daughter, from the very first trip, I, I pointed at the schools as we would walk past them, and I would say to my girlfriend, pay attention to just how different this is from any school you've ever seen in the United States of America, you know, or Canada. You know, it looks more like a prison, doesn't it? The French uh, philosophy of education and system of education began with Jean-Jacques Rousseau. English-speaking people do not read. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whoever the minister of education is right now in England or Canada or Australia, they don't read, they don't read Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It started with a totally different set of philosophical concerns and a totally different set of uh, institutional and political concerns. Um, and, you know, there are, there are bad things about the French system. Uh, I remember a colleague of mine said, so my degree is in political science, his degree is in political science also. He said the worst thing about the French system of education is that one person sits on stage and talks and the audience remains completely silent until one day you've completed your PhD and then it's your turn to sit on stage and, and talk. Um, Unlike this live stream, but you know, I, you know sorry, I know what he was talking about, though. I know it's no joke. There are authoritarian elements to French system education, uh, but I, I would really say, on a very profound level, uh, the French education system is totally alien to the, the British tradition and the American tradition. And, and if you're not looking for it, you might miss that fact. You might not recognize how alien it is. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Great. Oh, look, I got to tell you, this is the, the single best interview I've ever done. From my perspective, it's the single best collab I've ever done. I mean, yeah, you know, you didn't get to talk much, but from my perspective, it's a great collaboration. <laughs> I, I want to do that more. So maybe no, maybe thanks. Sometime, Man. I have a whole bunch of other stuff I want to talk about. I, I, I'd love it. And I got to tell you something. I mean, uh, I am not employed. The university is closed down due to coronavirus. I thought I was going to be in university. Even the library is closed. So I am not busy. I got a big stack of books, some of them donated by my viewers. Shout out to my viewers. Thank you for buying me books on Amazon, my wish list. Um, I got a lot of work to do. I make myself busy, but I'm not busy. So I'm, I'd be very happy to talk to you again. That was a wonderful interview. And also, I mean, you know, you said you already know me from my YouTube channel. I don't know you. But I, I can appreciate, I mean, you've really, you've really grown a lot as a person in two and a half or three years. I haven't known you for that long. But I mean, you, you've obviously really honed yourself as a broadcaster and a streamer, which is wonderful to see. I mean, whatever it is you go on to do, I mean, it may, it may have nothing to do with politics. You could be the next Philip DeFranco. Philip, De, Philip DeFranco also does politics, to be fair. But, you know, you know what, whatever it is you, you want to do with it, you know, it's, it's really wonderful to see someone who's stuck with it and, and worked hard. And, you know, at the end of the day, what that hard work does is it lets you be the person that you aspire to be. So it's, it's great hearing your voice, and it certainly is a contrast from that very first time I spoke to you. Uh, and, and this interview, for those who saw the video, it's a contrast to the last, the last interview uh, we did too, yeah? Less microphone talk. <laughs> okay, great talk to you, man. Stay in touch. Da -da 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 -da.